Hello, and welcome back to a brand new video. I apologize for the delay of this video. Christmas is always a crapshoot for time, and I had some issues trying to decide how to hammer this video. I'll try to aim these videos at bare minimum once per month from now on, as I try to do other projects as well. One's way too large to be feasible, but projects nonetheless. So last time we discussed the base mechanics of Exalted 3rd Edition, we learned not only how its inner engine works, but how to use that engine in order to gauge the difficulty of things from basic skill rolls to enemies just at a glance. But if that was everything I or anyone else ever had to say about combat design, we would be living in an ideal world. Real combat design is far trickier. Will we get a rough guideline of how a challenge or an NPC compares mathematically to a player? We never know how such a thing will turn out in play. Luck is always a factor, but we also have other things. How well do particular enemies work together? How does the environment aid or hinder people? Are there any objectives in the current encounter besides wipe out the opposing side? And last, how do charms factor into this equation? Oh my dear god, the charms. Today we'll be looking at combat encounter design. We're going to be discussing how to make an NPC specifically, selecting what monsters to use in encounter, and how additions such as terrain or alternate objectives can add some healthy spice to an encounter. We'll be discussing each of these things and how they relate to the game. Before I start, I will admit it's a bit tricky talking about one topic in particular for this video, because these things tend to heavily overlap. If I had to make a Venn diagram of the subjects in this video, then each of them would heavily overlap into one another. They're heavily interconnected in a relationship, more incestuous than a Dragon Ball to teenager at a family gala. For those watching the video, the game I'm showing you today is the Shadow Warrior 2013 remake. One of my favorite games, and one that's going to be used as an example in my video today. As before, you don't need to watch this video, but I figured it's related to the topic, and it would be neat to show a bit of it. Plus, I think it's a good game. Part 1. Combat Charms and Abilities Oh my god. Here we go. Remember when I said the base system of Exalted was pretty easy? Charms are where the real meat of Exalted lies. I'm not exaggerating when I say charms are by far the biggest part of the system. I can do not only an entire video on charms, but probably an entire video series on them. But after doing, oh, I'm going to guess about 1500 charms, I think I know a thing or two about them. Okay, so what are charms? You know how in Dungeons and Dragons there are feats and class features? These things let you do things that are not normally possible with a character just rolling straight stats without any kind of class? These abilities are what's called rules exceptions in terms of game terminology, allowing a character to do things that are not normally possible within a class's character. Charms are the rules exceptions for Exalted. They're magical powers that the overwhelming majority of the setting use for their effects in nearly some sort of way, shape, or form. Think of them as magical feats of sorts. Charms range from doing things from just a little bit better to literally making yourself into an elemental maelstrom nuclear bomb or turning yourself into a T-Rex. What makes charms hard to make without experience? Well, the biggest problem is often the biggest freedom it Exalted affords you. You're only limited by your own imagination. Outside of games such as Amber or Mortal's Handbook, Exalted Charms can be incredibly potent and powerful things, both within the context of the setting and overall narratively. Just how hard can they be, you ask? I'll go over the short list, but promise not their own way. How many motes should a charm cost? Should I add a willpower cost to the charm because of its power, or increase the moat cost? Should there be an initiative cost to the charm to offset things such as pseudo decisos or perilous charms? How effective is this charm or charm set at handling individual opponents or multiple opponents? Are there any magical flurries or flurry breakers? Should I make a separate resource and tie it into the mechanics of their overall set? Does the overall set of charms represent the character's lore and backs up the power given him by lore? How powerful is this charm overall to beings of similar essence levels? Yeah, these are just a few of the things you need to consider when you really start making charms. This isn't just unique to Exalted. It happens to virtually every other pen and paper game on the market. Even simple things such as Tristat or Fate Core still have you worry about things such as action economy and how to make antagonists stronger but the players not too strong to indefinitely stonewall them. But it doesn't have to be like this. 
you make some pretty good encounters with some simple effects and pre-made material. This is one important thing about not only being a storyteller, but a game master for any game in general. Cannibalize everything. What I mean by cannibalizing in this sense is to take from any other source you can use and just slap it with a cone of paint in order to call it your own. A good example of this a while back was when I made my Protoss units for fun. Yes, the ones from StarCraft, the video game. Inside of them, I started up an Immortal, a unit designed to tackle some of the bigger, tougher units in the video game and laughed directly into those units' faces with hardened force fields and power before weaponry. When I needed some opponents for an Earth God in the area, I immediately took my Immortal and made the Die Voktree, which is a bigger, tougher version of the Voktree that was designed to take on heavy hitters. I altered the stats a bit so they'd be a challenge for my players and threw them at them. To my surprise, the players really enjoyed the challenge that these enemies provided and some of the interesting ideas behind them. I'll throw a few links in the description to some fan-made monsters. There are also official resources in the 100 Devils Night Parade and Adversaries of the Righteous. They're pretty good aside from the elephant being way too strong for his own good. Like, seriously, what the heck were you guys thinking about that? But for how daunting charm design can be, there are some quick and dirty rules you can use to play with them. One of them being that player character charm design and non-playable character charm design don't always have to be equal. And this is especially true of non-exalt characters. I can tell you right now the charm pricing I use for exalted characters, but non-exalted characters throw them all out the window. Spirits typically have enormous moat pools, but charm costs are likewise inflated compared to the efficiency of exalted charms. Remember the power scale I told you about back in the last video? Spirits Essence 1 to 4 are enemies nearly any exalted are expected to win against. Spirits Essence 5 to 7 are much higher in power and much more specialized in the area, usually requiring a specialized exalted or a small team of exalted to handle. Spirits of Essence 8 to 10 are very powerful beings that are meant for an entire group or a very focused character. This is also imp very important for learning how to balance some of these charm effects out. Exalted opponents work a bit differently, however. Their essence scales only 1 to 5, but their charm power and efficiency makes it so they're generally almost always a threat. Even Dragonblooded, the weakest of the Exalted, have access to excellencies that increase their dice pools, which is actually a pretty big deal. Now this tangent has led me off a bit about charm design and then to enemy design, which is supposed to be the next area. But believe me when I say I had to get this out. So let's just get to the point. How do we make good charms to throw up against our players that are neither too powerful nor too weak? The answer to this was in my last video as well. Don't worry about dice tricks and use the dice pool comparison method. To recap, if an NBC character has one to three less dice than a player, then it's in the player's favor. If a character has one to three more dice than a player, then the chances are in the opponent's favor and the player typically needs to use charms to overcome this. If the value is 4 more or less than a player, then a challenge is either going to be very easy before charm use, or very hard without charm use. This is the way the base math works in the system, and such things are useful to know about before we start adding more dice and more dice tricks to the equation. You can keep in mind the dice pool when maxed out after raw dice. This is usually important, but not as important as the base pool. Knowing it helps a little bit, though. Now, how do we give the enemy some proper charms or and or abilities? Ones that really tell their story. One thing I can immediately tell you is if you have any turbo fancy powers, put those as notes for now, as the best place to stat is starting with the base charms. You want a solid groundwork before you start building up. As I said in my last video, numerical stats are actually very important. Your antagonist can have some of the most badass charms and abilities ever known, but if they're incapable of even hitting or hurting the players, or present a total curve stomp for them, you might want to rejigger some of those little charms. Now for a new storyteller, the most common enemy you'll need to stat up are some of the minion enemies. They're your weaker enemies that'll have names, backstories, or interesting traits. Generally, they're there to cause a minor obstruction at best to the players. These are things such as mortals, first circle demons, weak gods or elementals, or lesser rockshots such as goblins and buck ogres. This isn't to say that 
these characters are in insignificant or worthless. In fact, a human can have a lot of power narratively. But overall, for this video, we're just going to be focusing on things through a combat lens, specifically. Now, normally such creatures don't have strict dice adders. At best, they often have charms that let them double nines on non-combat rolls, double tens on some decisive attacks in very specific conditions, re-rolling a minor amount of dice, or some basic charms that fit their theme. Blood apes are demonic apes, so they have some beefy charms that let them do nasty things if you're grappled or prone. The Vok tree gets some pretty good soak options, and are capable of dishing out nasty damage in turn with even just a little bit of initiative. Garter birds have some pretty painful area effect attacks, but the issue for them is going to be getting to that point, as they have pretty poor defenses in both their soak and very few options in order to boost their defense. To go along with this, early opponents tend to have charms as singular things. See, the real power of Exalted comes with combining your charms, or comboing them together, into far deadlier attacks. Lower tier enemies tend not to be able to do this, usually having singular powerful attacks or solo charms. This is to keep them simple, as quite often they will not last long enough to have more involved effects in the first place. A good example of this is maybe instead of a charm to add dice and another charm to get double tens on the decisive attack, Maybe instead, the spirit will have a charm that adds a success or so in a very specific circumstance and the ability to double tens when you hit, the, hit it with the attack. Something like that. Now for far stronger enemies for new storytellers, there are some resources you can use. There are online monsters that people have made, but you can get creative and steal some things. In fact, one of the best ways to start learning is to take something someone else has made and put your own spin on it. Just be careful to give credit where credit is due. For example, take my Arc Vial monster in the Monster Homebrew manual I made. It uses the Nephrak as a base, but what I did was lower some of the soak, and some nasty range attacks, and a resurrection ability you have from Doom 2. Most of the work was already done for me. I just added in a few effects thematic to that specific enemy. Now, what if you want something a bit more complicated, such as a lesser dragon of the earth? Let's take Vakaru as a base and look at some of the water theme charms it has. Earth is all about being strong, so the grapple charm is being fine. Water drinking renewal could instead leach out purified stone instead of base water, and that's really it. In a pinch, it works well as an elemental dragon of another type. Don't be pressured to make something entirely new or new things constantly, but rather learn to look in the toolbox that we currently have and start snapping together baddies in a Lego-like fashion. In fact, this is one of the best ways of telling a good storyteller. You work smarter, you don't work harder. Now, this in combination with other Exalted will last you quite a bit of time, in all honesty. By the time players are going to counter some of the biggest and baddest enemies in the setting, you should be knowledgeable enough in order to make such an enemy yourself, or find a copy of one converted online for you. If you need more information, be sure to check out my Storyteller's Guide down below. I went into extreme detail of how to make enemies for Exalted. The Hydra I used as an example was based off the Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition version, with a few of my own personal little touches and changes. All the better to spice things up. I continue about more about such details, but then again, that was a rabbit hole I barely escaped from. Like seriously, I think I had like two other versions of the script. Right now, I want to give more of a broad overview of how to do things, and quick methods of how to do them. I nearly forgot to mention this. If you do look at my Hydra, you might notice how I made the Hydra have natural abilities rather than charms. A lot of the same advice I give there applies to charm effects, as well as big nasty monster effects that are usually made as a boss. Okay, so now we know how to make some individual enemies. We know the rough mathematical formula guidelines for fair play, and we've gotten together some enemies with some nifty abilities and charm-based effects. But how well do they fit all together? Part 2. Intelligent Individual Opponent Selection So what the hell do I mean about intelligent opponent selection? It means picking monsters that not only make sense for the current narrative or story, but also ones that make your players think about their next action with tactics in mind. This means, then rather haphazardly throwing opponents all together in the scene, you should consider what the strengths and weaknesses of everyone present and how best to utilize them. 
then have all the players react accordingly with this knowledge in hand. Examples of this can be learned from other games, most notably the new XCOM 1 and 2 games and the original Doom 2. Game Maker's Toolkit made an excellent video on this topic, but I'll bring over how it can be applied through the lens of a tabletop game as well. On the table, players are going to learn the traits of their opponents, either through study beforehand or by practical experience in fighting them. Over time, players will learn about these enemies and what they can do. Now, does that make these enemies useless now that the players know them inside and out? Far, far from it. The key decision here is how to utilize monsters with their own unique strengths and capabilities. And during combat, players will decide which ones they'll need to take out first and why. For example, if one player is an archer and there are Argata Riders on the field, that is, demonic archers, then it would have them to make sense to target the Argata Riders first, so that a slower, melee, or brawl using companions won't be kited and pelted upon such things that are capable of flying around them with impunity. Meanwhile, your melee and brawl friends would keep those blood apes or demonic champions tied up so they don't head over and bash your face in when, since you do worse at close range. Now what if we have a demonic spellcaster in the back? Maybe the head priest has the same stats as an arc vial, only that he can summon temporary shadows of demons instead of resurrecting corpses. The same punishing range attack and several spells. Now we're forcing the players to prioritize even more. Do they ignore some of the enemies in the areas, or do they force themselves to use more of their precious resources in order to put down some of the enemies sooner so they can quickly work on the demonic head priest? Now you'll notice there's a certain order of this battle somewhat. Players are encouraged to make meaningful, tactical choices to events going on around them, rather than just randomly reacting to what's going on. I believe this is one of the hidden aspects of what makes some games or fights memorable. As the battle it's itself is perceived by players for being challenging if it forces them to consider their actions beyond the use charm combo to win all combats forever option. If you want a Mastercraft course on how this is done, look at to Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition or XCOM 2. Each of these games has encounters where you're forced to think about the encounter at hand and the various enemies within it. Each enemy has a reason of why you want it dead first. And I think this is a good thing to keep in mind, even if you don't like playing Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. But let's use the game I'm playing right now as an example, Shadow Warrior. First, we have the basic melee demons. They try to rush in close to you and attack you with their claws. Individually, they're not that strong or special, but they come in packs and serve to block a direct path to some of the bigger, nastier demons or interrupt your aim. The basic ranged demons stay in the back and throw fireballs at you with once in a while flying above the stage in order to deliver a stronger range attack at you when they don't directly have line of sight, such as being blocked by the melee demons. Warlords are the big, beefy, bull-like enemies that carry around two swords. They're slow as hell, but have range attacks that will hit you if you're not constantly on the move, and a tether attack that can reposition you on the battlefield, and an ability to drive enemies berserk and make them much stronger. Necromancers constantly summon weaker versions of melee demons, use powerful range attacks on you, and bring dead enemies back to life, and throw up a shield to protect themselves and heal themselves when they get low on health. These are only a few of the enemies in the game, but even in the starting areas, you can see how they interact together. Melee demons will quickly try to run up to your face, forcing you to deal with them or take riskier shots at those behind them. But at the same time, you can't outright ignore the ranged demons, as there's no telling when they're going to go up in the air and try to use a more powerful and accurate shot against you. Warlords serve as a powerful force multiplier, and while easy hit, take tons of damage. Lastly, the Necromancer can force a battle to continue indefinitely if you don't handle it. So what do we deal with first? Do we attack the weaker demons constantly chasing after and harassing us? Do we deal with the ranged demons before they can fire off their stronger attacks and give us some breathing room? Do we deal with a warlord whose attacks are going to be difficult to dodge with everything else going on, even if it's much harder to kill? Or do we go, go for the necromancer to make it stop spawning enemies so we have a breather to deal with everything else? Each enemy in this has some reason to make you want to kill it first. Even the basic fodder enemies with very little, if any, abilities have some reason you want to kill them first. This is an aspect of game design that's invisible to most people until you really start looking into it, 
especially true when you're playing video games, as you're so conditioned to shoot things in front of you that I had to watch my fire on the rabbits in this game. Don't shoot the rabbits, trust me. Now does this mean that every encounter needs to be filled with rich, detailed enemies that forces the players to think tactically about each and every one of their decisions? Not really. That means we need things to save time. Either if we don't have enough time to make things as real life ate into your plan time, or something completely out of left field happens in your game, or maybe just new to the entire Game Master thing in the first place. In this case, it's okay to have simpler encounters. Not everything needs to be a grand dance of tactics. Sometimes a spontaneous fight breaks out in Tea House. In this case, we need a last minute encounter, which often involves pulling up some vanilla NPC stat blocks to serve as cannon fodder guards or the person you flip the tea table on. In this case, the important thing isn't seeking a rich, prepared combat encounter, but rather making the game flow organically. This means that it would make sense for demons to suddenly materialize if you're flipping the table on a sorcerer. But did your players scan the area ahead of time with spirit detection charms and you said all clear? Don't reverse that decision. Live up to your call. Likewise, an infamous general who distrusts sorcery wouldn't likely have dematerialized demons hanging around him and more so have several experienced guards instead. The tensions from this scene probably won't be from the enemies themselves, but the encounter with the person whom you flip the table on. What are you going to do when the, when the city guards arrive? What is the person you flip the table on going to do after you rough them up? God forbid you killed them, and what's going to happen? Did you flare anima, and now the area is probably calling out the big guns? In this instance, it's things like this that give the scene more dramatic tension than careful combat balance. Just remember a key trick for these situations. Never, ever throw out monsters that you made. You can always pull them back for encounters like these if you need a quick and sudden character sheet. Don't be afraid to give a small recess to prep for this, as even if just collecting sheets. Most groups are more than understanding for this. To make an enemy feel different, all you need to do is add one or two more skills, or maybe a brand new artifact that you find in Arms of the Chosen. Maybe one or two more charms as well, but then again, you don't need to really worry about it. Just pick an NPC from the past and use it until you feel the need to make a more involved sheet for them later on. Now we're going to talk a bit about the different enemy types that exist in Exalted 3rd Edition. The active initiative types, the battle groups, and the insignificant opponents. It's important to know the base details of each of these opponents when planning the game, and I'll tell you where each is the best fit for a role of the game, and how many of each you should be using in an ideal fight to keep things interesting, but not a slog. Active initiative opponents are those who use the initiative system rules as written. Their initiative goes up and down, they make withering and decisive attacks. They're the default vanilla combat system in place here. Second are the battle groups. Narratively, they're large clusters of opponents that serve as your Dynasty Warrior segues. Their initiative is always static. Initiative gain from them is very limited, so you only get initiative break bonuses and the only one for hitting. So any initiative lost by them is essentially initiative that you had flushed down the toilet. They also have some other interesting characteristics in that they're physically harmed by withering attacks. And if you're in initiative crash, then any damage dealt to you is health level damage, not initiative damage. Battle groups are inherently very lethal towards people with low soak values, or those without supreme confidence in their defense score. Anything ripped away from a battle group, you won't be getting back unless you reduce it in size. If a battle group has a commander, then that battle group could receive very hefty and free dice bonuses to their attack rolls, making them even more accurate and more deadly. If you're gearing up to fight multiple men, then caution is well warranted. At the very least, you'll want to grab armor, some soak charms, or just not be in the same general area as a battle group. Size 1 battle groups are quickly dealt with and shouldn't be an issue for long, while allied battle groups can really help tie them up. Otherwise, you'll want your friends to handle such things. Those are more tailored towards fighting battle groups. This doesn't mean that battle groups are unbeatable just a different approach for active initiative users. There are literally tons of whales to deal with them that don't involve attacking them until they die. Sorcery, Nova attacks, Rout, Intimidation, Social Combat, these are a few of the ways to potentially deal with them. Alternatively, just get White Reaper style. It's a hard, hard counter to the battle groups, to the point where 
if a battle group is going up against a White Reaper Silas, then it's going to be a very one-sided battle. Lastly, we have the character people don't know about because virtually nothing is used to describe them. The Insignificant Opponent. The Insignificant Opponent is a single entity or opponent on the battlefield that doesn't pose a significant threat by themselves. They're dispatched only with a single attack, or if health is even a question, then they follow the same rules of battle group, only they're knocked out when their health reaches zero. I'll be paying special attention to these guys a bit later in the video. Now you need to keep the main goal of how 3rd edition combat is handled. You build up initiative in order to use a decisive attack to KO your opponent, after which you are set to base initiative. Rinse and repeat until combat is finished. Now I will say this right off the bat. Tracking mortal guards or wolves as act singular active initiative opponents using the rules is dealt with fine by the system, but is often not encouraged. It becomes a slog when you need to deal with multiple enemies that are not only need decisive attacks to be KO'd, but need to go through the trouble of building up initiative all over again. Such things are what I call a slog. They basically only exist to suck up time and resources in a dull and boring way. Such creatures typically have very few, if any, decent traits to make them interesting to fight, and are often only overly durable punching bags. In this case, you can make them into a battle group. That way, they'll be dealt with lightning fast, they won't be taking up a half a dozen battle spots on the initial tractor, and they can be quickly dealt with by players being able to move on to a more interesting opponent. But Sandak, they do serve a purpose! They're there to make the players waste time, resources, and make them think more tactically by choosing whenever not to make a decisive attack on them. After all, if a player makes a decisive attack on such enemies, then they're in grave danger of being crashed. Yes, you're correct in that aspect, but it doesn't stop it from being a slog. If the only factor of interest for these opponents is that using a decisive attack on them puts you at hair's breadth away from being crashed, then you need better opponents. Again, there's nothing wrong with picking such opponents at the last minute, but outside of specific builds, they take way too long to deal with. And by specific builds, I mean about only two of them in the core book. So making such opponents in the battle group solves the issues of speed. Of course, if you decide not to do this, the game itself becomes a far more grittier affair, where each and every at attack and encounter with a character is, and can be, potentially fairly lethal. Again, you can do this if you want to suit the motif of your game, but in my personal experience, it just makes battles drag on and on until players get really bored. But if you've done that, you may realize two things. One, low-sized battle groups are often vaporized on the first round of combat by anything remotely serious or capable of combat, regardless of exalt type. Two, this is solved by increasing its size, but you may find it fairly awkward to fit a size 2 or, god forbid, size 3 battle group in a tiny arena such as a tea house. If you don't consider this an issue, then go ahead and let players vaporize the battle groups instantly. But what if we want to force the players to react to multiple opponents that don't take forever to kill and still have a perceived threat on the battlefield? My answer for this? Insignificant opponents. Now I'm going to admit right now a lot of this is my own opinion. I've talked to several other storytellers that share the same opinion, but I've also talked to several others which tell me to go to hell for even mentioning this. So feel free to experiment with this, and if you decide to do it or not to do it, then go ahead. But my personal recommendation with it is to go ahead. I may be biased in that aspect. Insignificant opponents are tucked away in a tiny, forgotten corner of the book. They're essentially size zero battle groups. Such things are perfect for lower powered opponents whom the players can easily defeat in single combat, and so this just speeds up the result. What I mean by this is, if the majority of your players can beat something such as a medium infantry without even breaking a sweat, then they're most likely going to be counted as insignificant opponents. This is convenient because you can have all of them in a single initiative count, as their initiative is static and doesn't move. While they have low accuracy, they always pose a threat, as if you are ever crashed, then they can deal instant health level damage. Lastly, they have durability by multiple members of them. A single point stylus can belt out over 50 levels of damage in a single turn. But when your opponent only has 7 boxes of health, then the other 43 are wasted and you're still left with several other opponents. 
I thought I was mad for using this, but several other storytellers I know have used them as well to pretty great effect. It turns Exalted into something like a Devil May Cry action type game. If you have too many of these things on the field, then go ahead and merge them back in a single battle group to speed things back up. It also adds an interesting power dynamic to the game, where if you decide to do something to make all mortals, weak spirits, and most first circle demons count as instinct of your opponents, it makes Exaltation feel like even more of a power rush innately, without the addition of many other house rules. If you want to make the game feel more gritty, feel free to tone it back, but do be careful if your battles turn into slog. Maybe only green guards or normal guards could count as insignificant opponents, but veteran guards always remain as active initiative opponents. Now there are several ways to go about using insignificant opponents in their games, and they can be largely customized depending on what you want to do. First, the size zero battle group. It works, but tends to be overly lethal if the players do crash. This is because if you have multiple of such opponents on the field, and each of them can do 12 lethal damage, this is pretty uncomfortable. It's good for making players sweat at the very least, treating them as a real threat when lower. If you do need to make them a tiny bit less lethal, make a rule that involves re-rolling the successes on withering damage as dice of lethal damage when they're crashed, so anti-decisive charms can fire off if the players want to use them. Number two, the strong type opponents I made for my own games. You'll see them in the Monster Manual if you download them. Basically, they function as size zero battle groups, only get half the damage inflicted upon them with withering. This helps provide a protective buffer when fighting them, which is useful for some of the stronger or more dangerous enemies that still don't fit the mold of an active initiative opponent, or we just want to speed up gameplay a bit. The last interesting one was told to me by Lioness on the main Exalted forms. Have insignificant opponents be active initiative enemies, but they take health level damage during initiative crash. This allows you to easily stay afloat and very simply convert any enemy you want into an instinct of an opponent with very little fuss or muss. But you have too many that it runs into the same issue of clogging up the initiative tracker and taking care of such things. Trust me, it's maybe a bit icky if you have suddenly 17 enemies on the initiative tracker and trying to take care of their indiv individual initiative values. One thing I'll say immediately is that instinct of opponents are meant for things much weaker than the players. So never ever do this with worthy opponents such as dragon blooded i mean you could do such things and drink the tears of those who complain they're actually really delicious but dragon blooded are generally left best as the threatening foes who can give anathema a pause or run for their money rather than the faceless mooksy mow down now the last term we're going to discuss is action economy is the term used for how many actions the player side can take and how many turns the antagonist side can take this is very important, as having more actions means more power. In 3rd edition, you can get overwhelmed very quickly when multiple people pile on top of you due to onslaught values. That is, your defense going down every single time you're attacked, whether or not you're hit. Likewise, since the vast majority of counterattack charms rely on decisive damage, it actually takes some time to build up damage to reliably use such things on your opponents. Now I know some charms can get around this, such as ready in eight direction stance or crane style. Single point style even has two initiative tracks. Those things are worth considering, but are the exceptions rather than the norm. Now typically you need to scale a combat so it doesn't last forever. Most combats I've seen in Exalted last anywhere between three to six turns on average, with the longer fights being the result of special boss battles or something really crazy going on. This is a sweet spot for most people, as combat will neither be too short nor too long. A good guideline metric for this is to have one active initiative using opponent per player. For insignificant opponents, then about two of them per player, if your group is inexperienced, or three per character, if your players have a lot of confidence in themselves or a lot of AoE attacks. Battle groups are tricky, but often I think a size two or three battle group is worth two active initiative opponents, while well, size 4 or 5 was worth 3 active initiative users. A size 1 battle group is treated the same as an insignificant component, so likely it will be dead just as fast, barring exceptional circumstances. Now this is a really rough guideline, as things can vary depending on the player's stats, the enemy stats, their charms and abilities, and finally just luck itself. Depending on the strength of each of these, these numbers can be adjusted quite a bit. For example, a size 
five battle group of siege lizards is going to be extremely durable and make players want to punch a storyteller in the face. A single solar is going to have a very hard time against five dragon blooded at once due to the sheer numbers advantage, but a solar and his lunar mate could be a much more balanced encounter. As even if the dragon blooded outnumber the solar and lunar peer, the sheer power of both of them make up for the disadvantage in the action economy. As a storyteller, you can also cheat a bit, giving some powerful enemies the ability to have two active initiative tracks at once. If you're using an enemy with two active initiative tracks and make them regain 10 moats per turn, then it's one of the quickest ways to make a powerful opponent with minimal preparation. This should only be done on the strongest of opponents, however, such as second circle demons, powerful hecanteers, or lesser elemental dragons. Spirits and other non-playable monsters are usually a safe bet as you can tailor them more easily and players can't typically access them. You can have a solar have two active initial tracks if you want and it might be a pretty good fight to end on, but some players might find it cheap that a solar can get two initial tracks and higher moat regen just by default, even if you save it for only the strongest of solars. Secondly, while two initial tracks is good for taking on at least a team of three more players, it becomes much harder to solo such enemies. One of the themes of Exalted is to go nuts with power and just feel like a badass. An enemy with two active initial tracks at once versus your one makes it much harder to beat them due to the action economy. Certain builds can overcome this, but it's something to keep in mind when you do want to use such a thing. In my opinion, I strongly recommend not to try this out if you're just beginning the game. Wait a bit until later in the game when you have more experience and you can start experimenting like this. Even if you do, I still say use such things very sparingly, as two initial tracks is can be really, really powerful, but at the same time can be necessary if you're fighting against a lot of players versus only one big bad monster. So now we have a vice of how to make our monsters and how to use our monsters. Now, unless we like fighting in a featureless white room for all of our combats, the next important feature of combat scene is going to be the physical location itself. Part 3. Combat Terrain and Non-Combat Challenges Now when you plan out combat, it helps to take the terrain into consideration. It can make each and every battle feel unique when it gives some side benefits and the other side disadvantages, rather than just fighting in a plain white room with no features for all eternity. Final Destination, Fox only. Not every battle needs to have some sort of terrain feature. After all, if every battle has high winds making it range attacks harder, or loose sand making movement harder, then such things become tedious really fast. Terrain and non-combat challenges can add some much needed spice to a scene. Enemies that might be easy to fight in a large, white open room might become much harder when suddenly placed in a cramped hallway. An open field might not give an enemy assassin many ways to hide, but in a cramped and noisy jungle, that same assassin might become a terror. Or how about making an escape route from an enemy army by shoving down a nearby tree over a chasm? This is to say nothing of having a fight on a ship during a tidal wave or fighting during a hurricane. Depending on how it's used, the very environment itself could be an opponent that needs to be overcome. So how do we have environmental penalties? The best guideline I can think of is to start from the examples roughly in the book, then every single time the word and is used after it, step up the penalty another factor. For example, standing on loose sand could be a negative one penalty to all your rolls, but if your opponent has their back to the sun, that could be very well be another negative one or two penalty. The sweltering heat from a burning building could give penalties after some time from the smoke or heat alone that kick in if you fail an environmental resistance roll. A demon that perpetually screams the glory of Malpheus so loudly that all other noise is drowned out could put a damper on such things, such as an occult role to try to find out his weakness, and so forth. Another interesting way of describing things I found helpful is to do with the way Fate Core does it. Each range brand could have an aspect to it that applies to people traveling through it. Tight alleyways could give an advantage to those who have weapons that are small compared to looking around Grand Eyeglaives. As one races out to a marketplace, they could suddenly be engulfed by a large crowd of people aspect that applies a penalty to your movement and attack rolls. If an opponent ahead of you suddenly tips over an apple cart and spills apples all over the ground, then we have a zone that has both a large crowd of people and apples on the floor aspects. 
This could apply a heavy penalty to running through the area, where you can say failure on the roll causes you to go prone, or make it count as difficult terrain that takes two actions to get through. Now these challenges can be bypassed by some clever charm use, and that's encouraged. Graceful crane stance could be described as a character running on the heads of the crowd without penalty, or monkey leap technique leaping over the fallen apple cart and crowd to be able to move normally. This isn't shortcutting the challenge, but rather rewarding the player for using their charms creatively and investing their hard-earned experience for such charms. Alternatively, you could have let out a mighty roar to clear the ray of the crowd. As I say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Oftentimes, you could have other objectives in a fight that you need to take care of, such as a caravan carrying a MacGuffin that needs protection, or people that need defending. In this example, the goal of the combat isn't about knocking out the other side as fast as possible. This not only puts the combat into an entirely different dynamic, but helps change up things, so it isn't just a winner decided by whoever kills the other side first. Big, flashy, involved scenes such as this are often what I call set pieces. They're often deliberately designed beforehand to ensure multiple challenges for the players to overcome. Typically, they're meant to be a climax or finale of a story arc in the game. They're meant to test the player's skills to the limits and be a memorable time for everyone involved. Let me give one such example of a combat from one of my old games. The players were in Autogothania, a vast machine realm, and were told by the local leaders that gremlin forces had kidnapped a portion of their population. In order to get on the city's good side, the players decided to rescue the people and bring them back to the city. After some investigation, their trek led them to an ancient hidden factory hidden high above the junkyard in the smog-filled pole of smoke. As the players entered the factory, they could see the workers toiling above a giant vat of molten metal, while armed gremlins worked as their slave masters. The vat of metal had denser and cooler pieces of metal floating on its surface as safe areas in the sea of molten metal, while catwalks positioned around the factory on the higher floors allowed archers to snipe their opponents from down below. Now, all the players could have easily handled the gremlin forces on their own, but the gremlin forces had one trump card, a powerful Gezlak, an automaton of metal with arms the size of grown men and thrives in environments of molten metal. The Gezlak managed to successfully use a stealth roll to hide from the players while they entered, but when the players attempted to run to save the enslaved workers, the Gezlak immediately reacted. He didn't target the players. Oh no. He grabbed the catwalk they were walking on and ripped it in two, making the players and the catwalk head straight down into the molten metal. As the catwalk slowly dipped and bent down into the molten metal, two of the players activated graceful crane stance. This allowed them to remain automatically upright and allowed them to treat a little bit in order to get to the safer part of the catwalk. The Ori Calcum Alchemical Last Order, however, didn't fare so well. She failed her roll and was starting to slide down into the lava, but the Soul Steel Alchemical Forge, another player character, was here to save the day. He quickly grabbed onto Last Order with a lucky roll and threw her over the sea of molten metal and towards the safety of the production area. Forge himself then used his movement action to leap on one of the nearby metal islands floating in the Sea of Magma. At this point, all hell broke loose. Last Order immediately activated her best defensive magic as she was severely outnumbered, and she's more focused on range than melee combat. The two remaining players activated what was Spiderfoot style, one heading towards Last Order, while the other raced up to the ceiling to deal with the snipers. Forge took on the Gezlak by himself. The Gezlak's superheated body was a bit annoying to deal with, as Forge was a tank and could easily resist it, but fighting such a creature that heals with molten metal in a factory full of molten metal was annoying, to say the least. The original plan of Forge was to stall this thing out so that when the other gremlins were defeated, all the players could gang up on this Gezlak and beat him into a fine paste. The fight on the production line was fierce. Players were attempting to pull double duty, protecting both the innocents and attack the gremlin forces. Thankfully, one of the players had crane style, so protecting the population was easy. The last order shot a gremlin, flinging his body into a machine, then melted it down and filled the area with noxious fumes, causing some of the workers discomfort, but nothing deadly. The Gezlak saw this happening and realized what the players were actually here for. The Gezlak immediately disengaged and forged, 
and raced over to the assembly line. The Gezlak there then grabbed the ventilation ducts of the factory, closed them, and welded them shut using the massive heat from his claws. The factory started to fill with noxious fumes. The smoke not only served to obscure one's vision, but was also poisonous gas that caused the workers incredible harm. The Gezlak then stood in front of the ventilation systems, seeing if he couldn't win the fight, then he could at least win the battle. And just like that, the priorities of the fight shifted immediately. Forge leapt onto the platform and redoubled his efforts to beat the Gezlak, but he couldn't go all out as he was too close to the innocents he was sworn to protect. Secondly, the Gezlak was still in his molten form and pretty goddamn tough to deal with even in normal circumstances. Last Order, being an expert in craft, made a declaration that a forge like this, there should be some kind of emergency extinguisher system. She knew that if the Gezlak wasn't in a molten form, that he'd be much easier to deal with. Given that Last Order is a dedicated crafter and no such factories in and out, I allowed it. This allowed Last Order to race over to the extinguisher system, pulling the switch. Water flooded the assembly line, and the Gezlak roared in pain as he rapidly cooled off, running back to the lava. Forge didn't bother chase after him. He went over to the ventilation system and put everything he had into a feat of strength to rip the ventilation system back open, causing the factory to regain clean air and clear vision once more. By this point, the gremlins were mostly dealt with, the players taking some minor damage, but nothing overly concerning. However, now the Gezlak was back in molten form, and more pissed off than ever before. Up until now, this has been, this has been a job for Forge, but after endangering those Forge was sworn to protect, he was pissed. But at the same time, he was worried that further combat would endanger the people here. So Forge decided the best thing to do was get the Gezlak out of this area. Forge leapt in the lava, powerful charms protecting him from the immense heat of molten metal, and dragged the Gezlak down to the bottom with him. Forge knew this factory was far above the ground, so to get rid of the Gezlak, he was going to punch through the factory floor, then kick the Gezlak out. With a single mighty blow, the entire factory shook, blasting the Gezlak out of the factory and into the smog-filled toxic wasteland below. Forge had half a mind to chase the Gezlak down and finish the job, but protecting the population was the main priority. He had to get the people out before the molten lake drained and the factory filled back up with toxic smog once more. Set pieces had come from anywhere. Now, do you know where I got the idea for this set piece? Metroid Other M. Remember that you don't need to steal your ideas from AAA resources. Rather, if you take aspects from other things, add a little spice to the scene and change a few details, even something from a lackluster game can turn into something the players will remember. In terms of designing these things, however, you need to keep your mind open to not only new ideas that happen in the scene, but how to make sure everyone can be involved in them. The extinguisher system, for example, is something I didn't plan for, but I allowed it after a roll because it made sense within the context of the scene. The molten metal itself is incredibly dangerous, but even in a worst case scenario, a new forge would be able to rescue the other players if they fell in the lava and that they have the health to survive at least a single turn. The charm's graceful crane stance and spider foot style greatly benefited the two other players allowing them to bypass incredibly dangerous terrain and make them feel rewarded that their investment for these charms is worthwhile. I did not expect Last Order to be thrown in the middle of a bunch of melee enemies, but it was either that or the lava bath. I knew my players, and I knew each of them not only well enough to know that I had the bare minimum tools needed to overcome this scene, but each of them having the skill set to contribute and be involved in the scene, rather than being on the sidelines. Let's do a small example of another scene you may be trying to plan out. A scene involving a runaway caravan racing down the hills while bandits lay on top of it. Before we get into any other details, we need to make sure the other players are on board with this. Do the players have the necessary athletics in order to remain standing upright and not constantly fall on their ass due to the shaky ground? If not, then allow enough space for someone to ride alongside the caravan on horseback allowing them to use archery to pepper shots at people who are on top of the caravan or those who are trying to board it. Is someone in your group a pacifist? Make a scene where he needs to take control of the reins from runaway horses or a roll to try to stop them. Fill in ways that try to make each of the players contribute in the scene, 
rather than worry about other DLC details such as MacGuffins, protecting players, and so forth. This is not to say such things are not important, but what is more important is to make sure that each and every player feels like they're contributing something. That should be the first and foremost goal you want to accomplish in any given scene. Now, does this mean each of the players need to constantly be contributing things 24-7? Again, not really. There are times where a player might just feel the need to sit out a scene because, hey, my ally is contributing towards this. Make sure the feeling isn't forced per se. You don't want a player to go, why do I need to bother contributing? This guy can do everything I can but 10 times better. You want to try to avoid that. So that about wraps up this episode. Hopefully now you have a better idea how to plan out your encounters beyond just mere numerical advantages and how to make scenes a tad more spicy for everyone involved. This sounds a bit daunting at first, but remember, getting good at this doesn't happen overnight. Start simple at first, then gradually build up to more involved mechanics and set pieces. If you mess up, learn from your mistakes and remember that even the really good people at this occasionally fumble. It's how you deal with these fumbles that separates the good from the bad. Remember, if you always need more set piece ideas, feel free to crack open a pre-made adventure book and just borrow some ideas from there. Next time, we're going to be discussing social encounter design. What makes for an interesting social encounter and how best to run one? So prep your poisons and hide your daggers for next time. <laughs>